Baby boomers. I used to be with it. Millennials. Okay, boomer. Generation X. What's going on? And Gen Z. <laughs> what do they have in common? Not a lot, it turns out. But one thing they can agree on is that this is the political podcast they want to listen to. Welcome to Not My Generation, the political podcast that looks at political events, news and happenings across the world and at home through a generational lens. Your hosts are Dr. Emily Stacy and Professor James Davenport, two political scientists from Rose State College. But the views expressed on this program are solely the views of the host and their guests and do not reflect the views of Rose State College, its administration, faculty, or students. Coming up on today's program, James always has a knack for saying the most controversial things yeah. and then getting away with it. News organizations and, and universities are actually causing deeper misunderstandings of people on the other side. Many of the things that, that we as political scientists and social scientists encourage people to do seem to actually make that worse, not better. The College Bowl is really an entry point for students who wouldn't have considered themselves or consider themselves political or involved to take their first step in their civic engagement journey. And now, here are James and Emily. Good morning, Emily. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. It's a wonderful Friday morning. It's a little cloudy. It is. Uh, a little overcast, I'm but uh, not bad. Uh, and uh, we've got some wonderful guests that are going to be on the program with us today. Yes. Uh, we just had, both of us were at the State of the State yes. address by Governor Stitt earlier. Do it you want to say anything about Yeah, it's been a busy week, right? So the kickoff of uh, the second session uh, of the 59th legislature was this week. Uh, so Monday started with the State of the State at the Capitol. Uh, so the governor always gives the kind of update, uh, the sure. health, right, the, the health of the uh, the state, uh, much akin to what the president does. You know, I've, I've yeah. been at a lot of these. Yes. I've never had a governor say things Things are horrible. Uh, you know, right, like, of course. I've, 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 it's always right. the best it's ever been. I've no matter who's been heard any politician actually right <laughs> say that. Um, it's certainly not advantageous to their, you know, to the super majority sure, that they're right. talking to. Exactly. exactly. Uh, but yeah, we got to take some students up uh, on Monday, and then yesterday was Higher Education Day, so right. uh, schlepping uh, Oklahoma students around. Wonderful stuff. I'm thinking we might need to do an episode, kind of a, a primer on Oklahoma government. Sure. So Time. Where, I agree. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who don't yeah. know how their state government works. Yeah. What's the ins and outs, how the legislation move through. Particularly what, our divided executive, yes, right? Which right. I think we, yeah. you know, you and I are nerds. Uh, and so we got some really great seats actually to the state of the state. We set uh, up against the press, mm -hmm. um, which allowed us to kind of look down on uh, the executive branch and to see who was there, um, but more notably politically who was not there. Right. Um, and so very interesting stuff uh, in terms of Oklahoma politics and, and and the uh, executives that are elected by the people and have to still work together. Um, so very, very cool stuff in, in our wild state of Oklahoma. Well, let's get to our guests today. We are very excited to have two guests uh, who work for um, similar but not identical organizations. Definitely we not. have um, Ariel Ms. Mizrah. Ms. Rahi, Ms. oh my Rahi. gosh, I'm, you are my offending Oklahoma, me. My Your Oklahoma wife is going to be just so angry right. with you because uh, Ariel, Ariel uh, can we can we get the we got to get the Ar I feel, Ariel. I, right. No, Ariel. Do you want to? Would you, you just like to do the step in? <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, Ms. Rahi, right? Uh, she is with Unify America, and this is such a cool organization. Uh, recently established. I won't give too much away, so she has lots of things to say. Uh, but I have been, as a professor, completely impressed um, with with what the organization is doing to uh, promote, uh, encourage uh, political participation via civic discourse. Um, it's incredibly important right now, regardless of how we vote, who we are, um, that we're able to, to communicate with one another in this democracy. That's it's how we're going to be able to save this democracy is compromise. So uh, we love Unify America. And then you can We've introduce- got Matt Cooper yeah. from by the Bipartisan Policy Committee, which I have worked with on. They uh, do some some events with higher ed institutions. Uh, I was able to go to uh, one uh, last summer 
uh, and do a present a, a small presentation, uh, kind of the same kind of thing. The, the, the title of it was a. Uh, uh, Discourses across differences. So, talking about how to foster these kind of conversations, uh, viewpoint diversity a little bit on campuses. Absolutely. So, uh, that was good. So, we're happy to have both of you yes. here with us. We have some icebreaker questions that we're going to run through real quick, uh, and uh, and then we will get to kind of the meat of the the uh, interview. But uh, you want to go first? Uh, sure. And we'll uh, let's start with Ariel. I'm going to say it like that from now on. I'm sorry. It's It's got to be a flourish. Um, so the first question, uh, are you, what generation are you? We've, we've kind of just excluded it to uh, Gen X and uh, millennial uh, or other, but, you know, I, I suppose we could be in other generations, but we'll start with Ariel. No, I, I am a millennial. Yes. Yeah, same here. Same here. So... Yay! I am constantly outnumbered on this. Huzzah! Show, right? You know, we need to get more uh, folks like uh, Sean Ashley and Paul Money's back on right. the show. Some, are you some let, folks in my generation? Let me let me ask you: of the spectrum of millennial, are you near the elder end, or are you uh, closer to the younger end? I'm on the younger end, definitely. Uh, probably on the older end for me. So. Okay, good. Good. I feel all right, Matt, you and I can we can be homies, dude. I'll be this is my year of uh, 40 in December. So I'm feeling very, you know, feeling my oats about I've got it. I've got Gen Z friends. So just put it that way. So. Same. Same Z's, right? We're good. All right. Question two. Um, what are you currently reading, watching or listening to? Matt, you want to take All right. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, uh, as an opportunity for a super shameless plug for an upcoming uh, BPC event. So I'm currently reading this book. Um, I don't know if it's going to show up properly uh, if it's reversed on on the camera recording, but it's called. I'll, I'll give the title Learning to Disagree. Yeah, by, and it's by, by Professor Jana Nazu, who's a law professor um, at Washington University in St. Louis. And um, this book is coming out um, in a couple of months. And um, it's, it's a, it's a fun book. And I, I think uh, you all might be interested to know that it basically follows the life of a university professor, um, sort of as, as he encounters difficult sort of free speech and civil discourse questions as he, uh, goes through, um, an academic year. Um, and it goes sort of month by month and he, and, but it's written for a general audience, um, who are just trying to understand how to better, um, better learn to disagree with empathy and respect. Um, and so, um, as the book comes out, um, at the end of March, we're going to host a host an event, um, where we'll invite, um, professor Nazu to join us. We'll have a, a interlocutor, another professor as well. And, um, we'll just learn about, um, just how far we can get uh, with empathy and respect in actually disagreeing better. So that's, that's the book I'm reading right now. Fantastic. I am reading something not too academic, but, um, I'm reading a book called Cork Dorks. Um, so it's about this uh, award-winning journalist who is getting into uh, the world of wine, trying to answer the question, what's the big deal about wine? Um, so she gets into like these underground wine groups. Um, I think her writing is hilarious, but also so informative and scientific in a lot of ways. So I find it fascinating about the wine world. I love it. Yeah. Uh, watching or listening to, we kind of... Like we just focused on the nerdy parts of things. Do you guys uh, turn your brains off at all? <laughs> I've personally been binging Star Wars. Uh, I've never been a Star Wars lover, but I'm getting into it. Good for you. If you ignore the prequels, you won't miss anything. I'm just going to say. And, but uh, that's just my opinion. I, I've, I've got thoughts, but I don't. I don't want to derail us. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> James always has a knack for saying the most controversial things yeah, and then right. getting away with yeah. it. All right. Next next question. Next question. Favorite social media platform? Ariel, we'll go back to you. I'm an Instagram lover. Instagram, yeah. You are you are definitely a younger millennial. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, how about you? Uh I mean, I I don't have a favorite. I will dip into Twitter, well, X now bizarre no twitter uh, Facebook. always twitter um, but i i really really dislike social media so i i kind of lurk in the background and observe but that's about it so. yeah sometimes yeah, it's enough. more like well it, this is the one that we use the most but uh we're not super fans of it yeah, right exactly uh i i still get harassed by dr stacy because i'm still on facebook and and use it a lot hey, i'm on facebook so too i feel you 
I just can't. I can't do it. All right. What's your favorite uh, pastime or hobby, Matt? Um, I've a few things. I, I really enjoy cooking, um, gardening. Um, I have been known to occasionally keep an aquarium, which is fun. I, I'm from Texas, and so I like smoking meat. Um, enjoy that pastime as well. So, Very good. Very cool. Uh, well, I'm in, we- I'm in Western Colorado, so my favorite pastimes hobbies are definitely nature related. So hiking, paddle boarding, you name it. Um, but since I am a fan of Instagram, I do obsess over Instagram recipes and try those out. Oh, cool. Week, pretty nice. Much. Very good. Finally, uh, one political view that puts you at odds with your peer group, colleagues, or family. Uh, well, I, I would consider myself politically homeless. Um, so I, I have yeah, a number sure. of political of views course. that would put me at odds with friends and family on both the left and the right. So I'll Same. Just leave it yeah. at that. Yeah. Yeah. I was, Ariel? yeah, I was noodling over this for a while, but I think a conversation that keeps coming up, no matter if it's a peer, a colleague or a family member is around the importance of voting. Um, and I find that with, you know, every year it, it just becomes a more normalized conversation of why is it even worth it? All right, let's get into uh, talking about your organizations and their missions. Let's uh, start with uh, Matt. Go ahead and tell us uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the Bipartisan Policy Committee. Uh, when when were, was it established? What what's its mission? Uh, and what are the, what's the work that goes into completing that mission? All right. Well, we call ourselves a center, so it's the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, so we're a Washington based uh, uh, think tank. It was founded in 2007 by four uh, former Senate majority leaders from both the Republican and Democratic parties. So Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, uh, Bob Dole, and George J. Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell. And our mission essentially is to bring together policymakers from across party lines to craft common sense, bipartisan solutions to some of our nation's most pressing problems. And the project that I work on uh, at BBC is called the Campus Free Expression Project. And we focus on supporting the vital work of colleges and universities in training the next generation's bipartisan leaders. And so uh, we provide guidance and resources to universities so that they can support uh, the next generation's development as, as independent thinkers, who are capable of constructive disagreement and and healthy civil debate. And so among other things, this requires colleges and universities to protect and promote um, discourse that is rigorous yet respectful uh, on their campuses. And that's something that we come alongside senior leaders in higher education to do better. Excellent. Fantastic. Ariel, tell us about uh, Unify America. Yeah. So Unify America, we're a national nonprofit working to replace political fighting with collaborative problem solving. Uh, So we provide virtual interactive opportunities for community members and primarily students to practice civil discourse. Um, And we were founded in 2020 by uh, Harry Gottlieb, who's also the founder of Jackbox and Jellyvision Games. Uh, So you might be familiar with games like Quiplash or Trivia Murder Party. Uh, Those are all Jackbox games. Um, and the products at his for-profit companies are obviously, you know, fun, engaging, and interactive. And he wanted his creativity and those other skills to help address the worsening polarization in America. Um, and the Unify Challenge was our first tool in doing so. And then after research and outreach, we learned that right there is a real need to address the issues campuses are facing across America. Um, and that's why the Unify uh, Challenge College Bowl was born. And we hosted our first College Bowl in fall of 2021 with 10 campuses piloting it. And we've since grown our participation to engaging over 8,000 students from over 160 colleges and universities in 40 states. Um, And the College Bowl now is held uh, three times a year, spring and fall semesters, uh, with a summer cup in between. Um, And during the event, we match thousands of students from different states, colleges, life experiences, political leanings uh, into one-on-one conversations to discuss 13 to 17 different issue areas facing our country. 
Um, and really the, the goal of the College Bowl and how it speaks to our mission is to provide students an opportunity to discover common ground, shared goals, and learn about new perspectives in a low-risk setting. Um, and every semester since we got started uh, the event five semesters ago, we have doubled participation to the point where this semester alone, we expect over 8,000 students to participate. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fantastic program. I, like I said before, um, I, I was so impressed when I was first um, approached by Unify. You know, we, we as professors get a lot of uh, email. We get approached by a lot of different organizations and it's hard to kind of, you know, sometimes glean what's going to work out best and what's not. Um, I was I was really impressed by the way that Unify has their stuff together, makes it really easy for the professor to deploy um, and the students were the most, I mean, just the, the takeaway, um, you know, students are very nervous, right? They're very anxious yep. and, and Ariel can probably speak to this. Um, you know, I think lots of folks are probably a little bit intimidated or nervous, especially college students um, in, in this hyper-polarized environment to speak about their opinions. And a lot of them that we are teaching are, uh, you know, sometimes concurrent or at the younger end of the age mm-hmm. spectrum and may not know where they sit uh, on the ideological spectrum. And so, you know, when you first tell them um, that they're going to be paired with another college student from around the country, um, you know, they they have wide eyes and are, you know, a little bit anxious. Uh, but the reflective essays that they wrote afterwards and, and the commentary that, um, you know, I received after, you know, they were paired up and, and had those conversations. I, I mean, it gives me goosebumps just to talk about right now um, how changed their opinions were and how how much more willing and and able and apt uh, they were to go and and discuss political issues amongst their friend groups or their families, et cetera. Um, so, Ariel, I'm, I'm curious, um, how can we grow this? How can we get more colleges involved? What do you need from me? Uh, and also, what are the major takeaways um, from the Unify Challenge? What have you guys gleaned um, so far from, from the Unify Challenges? Yeah, well, I first kind of want to get or, or kind of address something that you brought up is like why you were motivated to do this in the first place. Because um, I think there are a lot of reasons why professors and staff choose to participate in the College Bowl. I mean, first is it really doesn't require a, a traditional university structure to implement. Um, so it's free, quick and easy for any faculty member or student facing staff member to utilize. Um, second, it's really quick. Um, so kind of to your point, Dr. Stacy, from, you know, learning about the College Bowl to signing up, to implementing it, to getting students to register, faculty on average are actually spending around 30 minutes from beginning to end. Um, third is we provide multiple days and multiple opportunities for students to participate. We are increasingly engaging more and more diverse communities and institutions who have a whole range of commitments at school and outside of it, and we don't want there to be a barrier to involvement. So that's why during the fall and spring semesters, we host our College Bowl across six days and at least 12 one-hour opportunities. And as we have more and more students participate, we continuously add more dates and times to accommodate participation. And then lastly, it's it's just really high impact. Um, so the, the College Bowl is really an entry point for students who wouldn't have considered themselves or you know, consider themselves political or involved to take their first step in their civic engagement journey. Um, from over the 8,000 students who have participated in the College Bowl so far, over 2,800 have indicated they want to do something else, whether that's something else with us or that's doing more on their campus or in their community. So we've partnered, for example, with the All In Campus Democracy Challenge so students can look up their voter registration. Um, And we've partnered with Power the Polls if they're interested in learning more about what it takes to be a poll worker in their community. Um, So that begs the question, all of these great things and why people do the thing in the first place, um, but how do we get more colleges and communities involved? Um, First is, I would say, invited into spaces like this podcast are a wonderful way to spread the word to a lot of folks. Um, But largely, our success in growing the College Bowl has been from the ground up, one professor at a time, often. Um, And, you know, professors sharing their experience and their students' experiences uh, with departments and colleagues and other areas on campus are a great way to spread the word. And although working with 
you know, directly with student leaders hasn't been the main way we've engaged with campuses. We're starting to lean more into working with student governments and dialogue oriented student groups on campus as more student leaders really own this work alongside with um, faculty and staff members. Um, and then I, I think for major takeaways, I, I feel like I do learn something new from our campus partners and nonprofit partners from across the country. Um, but some main takeaways um, for myself, um, first would be bubble busting conversations with someone a little different can have a massive impact on democratic participation. Um, coming out of the challenge, 55% of students reported that they were more likely to vote in upcoming elections. And additionally, 63% of folks who have participated in the College Bowl said they felt more hopeful about democracy. And then additionally, these conversations, how I see it, aren't just about tackling political polarization and ultimately strengthening our democracy, but they're also about reframing and normalizing political conversations. I'd say when most folks think about politics, they're thinking about name calling and bickering and yelling and a lot of derogatory and inflammatory language, the conversations students are having through the college bowl, bring them back to earth, remove them from their own world and provide a series of goal statements to identify commonalities first and foremost with their partner. Um, and I'd say political polarization is obviously a massive issue, but the symptom of it, the lack of participation is arguably even bigger. Um, and if we can pro provide spaces that allow folks to practice politics that prioritize active listening and understanding, I think ultimately that will lead to folks being more likely to seek out opportunities uh, to get their to get to know their neighbors and really thoughtfully engage in their community. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Matt, I want to shift to uh, talking about uh, some of the work that the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center uh, conducts. Now, as your name indicates, you guys are involved in policy-related matters as well and interacting with, with legislators and, and such on, on policy. But as we've discussed, you also have a, a focus on uh, reaching out, as we talked about, the, uh, the, the initiative with higher, uh, higher education institutions. What I'm interested in, given that we're coming, we are in an election year, um, are there some events coming up this year that you can, you can say, hey, the, these are things that are going to help voters in making uh, more informed decisions come November, at least helping them think through issues or how they perceive these issues? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So um, like you suggested, um, the Bipartisan Policy Center um, you know, mainly focuses on policy. And so uh, we mainly bring together policy leader, policy makers and industry leaders. And so our, our efforts, our events um, at our organization are almost entirely focused on sort of bringing them together. Um, but if you want to learn more about a particular area in domestic policy, whether that's energy or healthcare or housing or immigration or technology, the role of AI, um, you know, we have you know plenty of resources um, on our website where you can go and become more informed um, about those issues. We also have a really great since we have an election coming up, we really have a, a, an excellent team that's doing work on election integrity and um, the nuts and bolts of the election administration, uh, the process of administering elections. Um, and so if you want to know more about sort of the issues um, going on in that space, um, we've got some great resources there. Um, and and on the uh, the side of my project, um, you know, the Campus Free Expression Project, um, one of our goals is to support um, the civic mission of universities, to help universities prepare students to become good citizens in our pluralistic society. Um, and Unify America, I think, is, is doing that from one angle, and I think we're doing that from another angle, right? So if we want to um, cultivate voters who are informed um, and who are civic-minded, um, one of the best places to do that is in the context of uh, our colleges and universities, right? So we need to help um, we need to help students do that. And I think Unify America provides some absolutely fantastic resources, especially to professors that they can use in their classrooms. Um, but we also need to help uh, senior leaders, uh, trustees, presidents, provosts, um, sort of think through um, how to sort of holistically uh, promote these these values on their campuses as well. And that's something that the Bipartisan Policy Center does. 
Yeah, and I think that's something that uh, is also kind of near and dear to to mm-hmm. Dr. Stacy and I's Absolutely. heart. Of uh, it, it, it's it's important for students, uh, as you mentioned, but it but for students to have that exposure, it, the faculty, the administrators have to also buy into Absolutely. this type of stuff. And, and, yeah. and I'm just again, I'm going to give. Uh, my own experience in the uh, discourses across differences symposium that I attended last year at uh, Austin Community College, uh, in which we had faculty uh, and a, a few administrators from across, really across the country that that came there and talked about how can we uh, incorporate different programs, different projects to to promote this ocean of civil discourse, uh, viewpoint diversity. Uh, how can we integrate those into what we're already doing? Uh, and I think that's so important uh, that, you know, as Emily said, faculty are busy. We're, we're doing all sorts of different things. Uh, we don't always communicate well with one another because uh, we get into our little silos and, and, and are doing, doing our projects. Uh, and the ability to have some resources available that we can easily draw upon and say, here's a model. Here's what's been working at other institutions, or here's what we've discovered through research that seems to work is really important. So uh, absolutely want to, um, to to give a plug and to say that I think that is so important uh, on that, that end of just helping faculty understand how to work through these issues themselves. So given the hyper polarization in our uh, political environment, um, both of your organizations seem to be kind of uh, Sisyphus, right? Rolling rocks up hills, um, you know, futilely. Uh, Why should we be optimistic uh, that such polarization can be overcome uh, through initiatives such as uh, those in your organizations? Matt, we'll start with you. Okay. Well, so to be candid, I don't think there's a lot of reason to be very optimistic in the short term, because I think um, we're all caught up in some (laughs) structural forces and trends that are bigger than, um, you know, any one uh, demographic group or any one organization. And and we could talk about that. I'm a former political science professor, and and I could sort of nerd out with with you all all day on this, but we can sort of set that aside. I I think um, one of the things that gives me hope is um, just the proliferation of organizations like Unify America the Bipartisan Policy Center, and, and there's a whole host of others as well. I mean, there's the Constructive Dialogue Institute, More in Common, Bridge USA, Braver Angels, and, and we could we could add more. And I think that sort of collectively, this, this demonstrates that there are policymakers and scholars and philanthropists and other leaders who are serious about cultivating a healthier political culture. And I think what you see historically is that change happens when you have dense networks of leaders and institutions that are sort of pushing forward together, um, working all the different angles to make that happen. Um, and so from my perspective, um, sitting you know, at the Campus Free Expression Project at um, BPC, I think um, some of our hope also lies in raising up the next generation to be better. Um, and helping colleges and universities do better as they prepare tomorrow's leaders um, to take on um, some of the uh, most important challenges that we face as a country. Yeah. Ariel, you want to jump in there? Yeah. I mean, I was going to say what, what also makes me optimistic is the number of organizations out there tackling the issue Um, kind of to Matt's point, because it takes and will continue to take a combination of organizations on the local state and national levels all coming at the issue from different points of view, along with student leaders and faculty and staff on campuses across the country to even make a dent in the issue. Um, And then looking from my perspective um, and looking at kind of Unify's work is the number of students saying that they just feel more hopeful about our society coming out of a a really simple conversation. Um, So it, it clearly shows that providing, you know, a space to share perspectives where students can build confidence, sharing their unique point of view and potentially make a new friend in a different part of the country is just so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. The continuity of the democracy is at stake here. I I continue to shake my my elder millennial fist at the sky about this. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and to your point, I mean, just this week, we saw kind of that uh, bipartisan approach to something take a huge yeah. hit, right? I mean, our poor uh, censured senator, uh, you had a, yes. a bipartisan 
uh, negotiation on uh, trying to address some immig- immigration issues. Uh, Senator Langford, who is from Oklahoma, was leading those negotiations. Uh, and before they even released the report, you already had uh, members saying, oh, no, we're not going to support that. Or we, we, and it was such a uh, disappointment, right? Regardless of whether or not you feel like that was the best way to approach immigration, whether that was the right, here you really did have a bipartisan approach to getting this done. You had uh, yeah. um, three, uh, so you had uh, Langford, you had the senator from Arizona who's now an independent yes. Uh, and I forget the the, the senator uh, and uh, the, the the there was a Democrat involved in it, and I can't remember their name. Was it Chris Murphy in Connecticut? Yes. that's right. Yeah, I'm that's sure, right. Yeah. So those three. So Republican, Democrat, Independent, leading the negotiations on this, come to this this agreement, and uh, and then you see it just tanked. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was really disappointing. It was to dead see on that. arrival uh, yeah. because that's what we need. Yeah. We need sure. people to be able to, and that's my concern yeah. is that young people in our classes uh, see that kind of behavior and think that's normal politics. Yes. And, and uh, what we need to do is to be able to say, no, that's abnormal and we don't like that, right? But it, it seems like uh, right now, a, a, as you kind of alluded to, Matt, that is the the world that we're in, is that it is really hard for people to reach across the aisle to say, hey, I'm going to give a little bit, you're going to give a little bit, and we'll get something done. Yeah, I think I think there is actually um, appetite once problems get back bad enough to do um, something to come together to solve problems. Um, I think, you know, some of the reason you see some of these bipartisan solutions being tanked, you know, sometimes it's by, um, you know, folks on on the extreme right. Sometimes it's by folks on the extreme left. But but the point is, you know, they're often tanked um, because. Um, some of the the main people sort of driving the boat, so to speak, are on the extremes um, and would rather have sort of the issue than to actually solve the problem. Um, and so I guess, you know, there's a, a sort of a glimmer of hope in the fact that there are people that actually do want to come together uh, to solve real problems. It's just there's some some other sort of structural reasons in Congress and our primary si- system um, that are that are making it um, difficult for sort of the adults in the room to push forward with solutions when you have um, sort of people in the extremes um, that are trying to tank them. And such a contentious presidential election year uh, yeah, as well. Yeah, it's, it, and it's, it's going to heat up even more in the coming few months. Oh, so. I know, man. My, I've, I've got my Tums just in bulk <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, some research that I found really interesting and, and a little concerning uh, was the study that the the organization More in Common conducted with uh, YouGov, the polling firm YouGov, uh, and they they were looking into how well Republicans and Democrats understood each other, and they found that there's this significant what they call the perception gap. Uh, basically, Republicans and Democrats don't understand each other very well at all. Uh, what I found really interesting in, in this report is that many of the things that, that we as political scientists, as social scientists, encourage people to do seem to actually make that worse, not better, right? So they, they found, you know, we tell people, hey, um, be engaged, be informed. We're talking, we, Emily and I are constantly talking about the importance of civic engagement. And, well, what do you find? The people who are most engaged, most committed, misunderstand the other side even more. Right. Uh, We tell people, be informed, know what's going on. And yet we find the people who consume news the most often have completely unfounded perceptions of the other side. Right. Uh, And and so what do we do uh, and how do your organizations approach fostering the kind of uh, communication, the kind of dialogue uh, that avoids those traps of uh, excessiveness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I I don't want. Uh, I don't think the answer is don't be engaged, right. don't be informed, right? Uh, uh, don't be educated. That was another one that I found really interesting. Was even education can lead to uh, this this perception. How do we avoid those traps? And, and how do your organizations uh, in, in the work that you do avoid those kinds of traps? Ariel, I'll ju- I'll start with you. I mean, one of the conclusions that stuck out to me from the research was that we need to directly engage with people whose experiences and views are different from our own. 
And with Unify, in, in a nutshell, that is exactly what we're providing to students and community members who participate in our programming. We're framing the College Bowl as a perspective sharing conversation, not a I'm right, you're wrong type of conversation. You're provided with a, a goal statement on, let's say, gun violence or climate change and be asked to provide your unique perspective. Essentially, how have you interacted with this issue area in your own life uh, or your community? Um, and it's really clear from participation in the College Bowl. I mean, over 70% of students say that their conversations, when framed around perspectives and shared goals, expose them to another point of view that they've never considered before and they've never come in contact with and potentially would never come in contact with depending on where they're at in the country. Um, and, and also from these conversations, which I find really interesting is not only are they learning about that new perspective and they like this type of conversation um, about learning ab about a view that's different from their own, but because of those experiences, students are now saying that they're more likely to share their point of view on current events and politics on campus. Um, so I, I think it's from, from the research and from the conclusion, it's really clear that, yes, providing folks with direct opportunities to engage with people whose experiences are different from their own, even for just one hour, um, can make a really big impact on your participation in your community. And I'll jump in on that because this is, Unify America is designed basically precisely to fill in that perception gap. Because the perception gap basically is indicating that um, news organizations and, and universities are actually causing deeper misunderstandings of people on the other side. So the more educated become, the more news you consume, um, the more that you imbibe caricatures of what the other side actually thinks about an issue. Um, and so you actually think that the other side is more extreme than they are in real life. And what Unify America does is actually say like, okay, we're going to connect you with real life people on the other side. And so that they can present to you, no, here's actually what I think. Here are my motivations. I care about this country too. Um, and then you can understand like, oh, they aren't extreme. They're reasonable. They have reasons for their views. And they also care about this country, right? Um, and they're not hateful, spiteful people. Um, and so Unify America tries to fill in that gap. And I think colleges and universities need to do a better job um, on this sort of systematically. Um, and that's one of the things that um, we're concerned about here at the Campus Free Expression Project. Um, what's interesting about this data um, is that um, that colleges and universities are really not doing a good job exposing to students to a variety of political viewpoints. And this is especially true of the best arguments and ideas that are on the conservative side. And so if you actually look at the data, um, the more in common study shows that uh, Democrats uh, misperceive Republicans, that misperception actually becomes worse the more education they receive. Um, and this really shouldn't be surprising since uh, one in 10 faculty members um, in higher education um, are conservative. And the ratio is even more skewed amongst um, senior leaders in higher education. And so one of the things that um, the Campus Free Expression Project um, tries to do is we, we encourage higher ed leaders to enhance um, viewpoint or ideological diversity on their campuses. Um, and also just in general to um, to, to foster more robust inquiry and uh, respectful discourse um, across difference. Um, you know, we think that colleges and universities are the best place for conversations that can enhance mutual respect and understanding and that can really help deepen um, our mutual appreciation for each other's viewpoints and, and the complexity of, of problems that our country faces. And I think um, BPC and, and Unify America are both tackling this, this sort of perception gap problem um, from a similar, similar vantage point. Uh, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, no, no. no, no. no. I, it was a perfect segue uh, to, to uh, the last question. So uh, as James noted earlier, uh, he ha was able to participate in discourses across differences. Um, tell us about that initiative and its goals. Was it just a, uh, it, it's a long-term project, correct? And uh, what kind of response have you received from participants? Yeah, so um, so the, the symposium that uh, James um, participated in, and if I'm not mistaken, James, you were you're actually one of the uh, one of the conveners. This was before I came on board the project. Um, we we have we have a number of these symposium every year, 
Um, so symposia every year. So four or five in addition to sort of other events that we do. And basically what we do is we bring together um, leaders from various colleges and universities, usually oriented around a particular theme or a particular type of institution. So in this case, it was community colleges. But we uh, recently did um, a symposium for faith-based institutions. Um, we've done a symposium for small liberal arts colleges. We have um, another symposium coming up um, at Purdue University that's focused on STEM um, this upcoming March. And the response to um, to these symposia that we host has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, the the presidents and the deans and the faculty um, that and the administrators that that come to these uh, conferences um, are able to to get ideas and resources and talk to each other about what works and what doesn't in promoting free expression and academic freedom and civil discourse um, in a in a better way on their campuses and. And this has led to, to real changes. We've had um, we've had you know, presidents and their teams adjust um, policies on their campus, um, introduce leadership training, um, take a different approach to institutional institutional speech, um, and this has generated uh, a demand for us to produce more resources. And so, um, so currently, one of the things that we're working on is creating um, a series of pamphlets um, for different target audiences. Um, in higher education. So we're creating a booklet for presidents, another one for trustees, uh, another one for faculty, and another for student affairs uh, administrators, basically providing them um, particular guidance and tabletop exercises and scenarios uh, that can help them think through um, these issues from within their own sort of uh, leadership capacity, how they can uh, better promote civil discourse um, at their particular institutions. One of the things that I found really helpful with with this was uh, we had a follow on meeting uh, about six months after the symposia where many of the faculty that had been there came back on. It was a Zoom meeting and we just talked about, um, OK, how things are going. What, what have you been able to do? What what challenges have you run into in trying to foster this this kind of dialogue across your campus? Uh, and so that was really insightful in hearing from some of the different uh, faculty uh, at different institutions, what challenges, what what uh, what successes they've had in trying to foster this kind of dialogue, and and I'm going to say I think we at, at our institution at Rose State College have been fortunate that we've been able to foster a lot of conversations about a lot of topics. No one in our administration, no one uh, on the campus, no other faculty have tried to shut down any kind of conversation or say, oh, you can't talk about that. Uh, uh, and and I think that's so important is, is to be able to demonstrate that you can have difficult conversations. You can have conversations on issues that people are very passionate about, but you can do so in a way that we can all learn from, right? You can do so in a way that better informs us about that issue. What are what are the areas that there are overlap where we actually have common ground on? What are those issues that that we have differences and why do those differences exist? You know, I think that's so important that we can uh, do that uh, and be like you said. That's where college campuses should shine brightest in the ability to conduct those very kinds of discussions and, and conversations. And I'll just say briefly too, and I don't want to to hog the mic, um, but. You know, I, I know, you know, higher ed, you know, um, it, it is, is dealing with some problems right now. Um, and there's, you know, higher ed has been in the news and not in a good way over the past few months. Um, and there is a real need for full reform. But what I find encouraging in the conversations I have with, you know, university um, you know, leaders and, and faculty across the country is that um, for every uh, institution that is sort of failing epically, there are other institutions and people who are actually doing really good work. Who actually care and um, who are are um, really dedicated to doing this right, um, and and that's what gives me some hope um, that colleges and universities can actually continue to be um, leaders um, in this way. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to uh, shamelessly plug myself, Matt. Now you know another uh, community college professor. I, uh, I uh, my expertise is comparative politics. So if you ever need, you know, just somebody to come in and you know be on a panel or anything, I'm, I'm also <laughs> okay. very willing and available. We love that kind of oh, stuff. Absolutely. We do. Yeah. 
the uh, let me let me wrap up with with this. I want to talk about we've talked about some of the challenges and we've talked about some of the um, the, the difficulties. But um, give me your your thirty to each of you. Give me your thirty to second si- uh, sixty second uh, elevator pitch for why we should actually be optimistic. Why are there some things going on that give us some hope that the turmoil that we see going on right now is is not what we uh, are stuck with. My answer is it's generational, but <laughs> going to sneak in there. Matt, go ahead. I'm sorry. Or actually, Ariel, go <laughs> ahead. We haven't heard from you in a long time, my friends. Well, I think a lot of it kind of piggybacks on what Matt said. Um, my So my background is in community and student organizing work. Um, So I've been working in the higher education context um, through an organizing, grassroots organizing kind of perspective for a number of years. And really, no matter matter the year, no matter the campus or the state that I've, I've worked in, there's always been intelligent and passionate people on campuses, whether they are students, faculty, and staff who are really dedicated to doing this work right and also centering diverse student voices when it comes to solving massive problems facing their institution, their state, or their country. Um, so I, I mean, I continue to see that every single year, every single month, no matter what is happening nationally. Um, and so I think that's what really keeps me going at the end of the day, but in particular, um, students keep me going too. Yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. They are the future, man. I I try not to sing Whitney Houston to them, um, yeah. you know, as often as often as they they fight me. But yes, Whitney wasn't a millennial. She no, she was not good. <laughs> yes, that's good math, James. You're correct. She was not. I feel like I'm singing out of out of the same uh, the same songbook here. But um, it, it just you know, as a former professor, um, it really is sort of seeing the engaged uh, the engaged students that that gives me some hope. Um, I think our nation does go through, I mean, historically we go through cycles of sort of deep discontent and polarization. Um, and, um, that's not to say we are always destined to go through cycles. Um, you know, every nation state, you know, um, sort of, you know, its existence ends at some point, but I don't think we're necessarily there yet. I still think we have sort of deep reserves of sort of cultural capital that we're still drawing upon that needs to be replenished. But I think part of the way it's replenished is through um, sort of um, training up the next generation um, and, and equipping them um, with with the capacity um, and and the motivations um, to to do better. Um, and and I think a lot of them do. Um, and I, I've seen this in, in in the students that I used to teach um, students who had deep and profound convictions um, from different sides of the aisle. Um, but who were not um, obstinate and unreasonable, um, who genuinely wanted to understand, um, you know, other viewpoints and who genuinely want to do good in their communities and for their country. Um, and so seeing, seeing those students um, graduating, going on to do good work, um, that's really sort of the main thing I come back to that gives me hope. Amen. I uh, am going to have a, a point of personal privilege. Um, our little Remington uh, Napudi, I'm going to shout yes, out. Yes. Uh, we're, we're graduating our very first uh, attorney from OU Law School, um, it, or my very first, I suppose, uh, in terms of students that I've mentored, you know, personally. And so I'm, we're we're very pleased. I feel like a proud mother, like <laughs> super gross, like ugly cry the other day whenever I took it's like, yeah, it's it's those moments, right? Where where you know that, you know, these kids have gone and they've, uh, you know, grown and have taken something from, you know, your classes and and your, you know, blithering on except your, your grand pontifications and have applied it to their their actual lives. It's it's a beautiful thing to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate mm-hmm. both of you yes. uh, being on. We will link in our show notes to both of your organizations Absolutely. so people can find out more about the work that you do and perhaps find a way to get involved as well. Uh, if there are any any initiatives that we can be of assistance on, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to either of us. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, we will probably want to bring you guys back at some point 
uh, and and talk about uh, some more of this. Maybe uh, maybe later in the year or Closer next year, election. once uh, yeah, yeah post, kind of a post election yeah. wrap up and see see what we think our state of democracy is in uh, following that. Uh, but uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. We thank you both for being here. Indeed. Uh, and we want to remind everybody that politics is not a spectator sport. That's right. We'll see everybody next time. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you both. We love communication that goes both ways, not just you listening to us pontificate. We would love to hear from our audience. If you have comments, suggestions, or would like to contact us about possibly being a guest on the show, please email notmygeneration at raider.rose.edu.